Welcome, my dear students and others, to this Chapter 12, continuing coverage of the structure of solids. In this one, I'm going to teach you about unit cells. So if you could zoom in really close to examine a crystalline solid at an atomic or molecular level, you would see that the entire solid is comprised of a small repeating unit called a unit cell stacked over and over three-dimensionally in all directions. Thus, the structure of a crystalline solid can be defined by the size and shape of its unit cell and the location of all of the atoms within that unit cell. Here then is a model of the unit cell of sodium chloride taken from our text, which I've referenced in the description below. If you look then closely enough at a pile of solid sodium chloride, that is if you could zoom in on the atomic molecular level, you would see this unit cell repeated over and over in three dimensions throughout. Although the colors probably wouldn't be green and purple. Anyway, the point is, there are different kinds of unit cell structures, which vary according to the size and bond distances of the individual atoms in the solid. Now, I do not want you, my university students, to memorize any of these. I'm only showing you them for the sake of interest. Here then are some generic unit cells for some metallic structures, which you're welcome to pause and look at for a moment. And here are some unit cells for some simple ionic compounds. Isn't that beautiful? I thought so. This dovetails beautifully then into our next subject, lattice structures. So chemists name unit cell structures by the geometric arrangement of their individual nuclei. If we treat each nucleus as a point in a three-dimensional shape, then all unit cells can be categorized into one of the structures below, believe it or not. Each of these is called a crystal lattice or lattice structure. To determine a compound's lattice structure then, you have to match your unit cell by angle and relative dimensions to the corresponding structure from the figure that I just showed you, which happens to be figure 12.6 from our text. This takes us then to a beautiful example problem, which I will help you with. So the unit cell of nickel arsenide is shown right here. I want you to tell me what type of lattice this crystal possesses. So in order to do this, we of course need to take a look at this figure and compare it with the lattice structures I showed you a moment ago. What are the details? Well, you'll notice looking at the unit cell from this angle, its height is 5.10 angstroms. But looking down the barrel at it from a top bird's eye point of view, shown over here, its width and depth are 3.57 angstroms. In other words, this unit cell has a height that's different from its width and depth, which are equal to each other. Additionally, the angle looking down the barrel here is 120 degrees, whereas the angles looking over here are obviously perpendicular 90. Which of these lattice structures matches that? Yeah, you can hopefully see it's hexagonal because I've got a bond angle of 120 for one interior bond and 90 for the others. Additionally, two of the lengths of the sides, the length and depth are equal, and the third, its height, is not. Does that make sense? Good. That's how you do it. Which takes us to another subject, empirical structures from unit cells. So as it turns out, you can determine a compound's empirical formula by adding up the number of total atoms inside its unit cell. Here's the trick though. When doing this, you only add up the atoms that are inside the unit cell. Now this means that if an atom is straddling one of the edges or if it's at one of the corners, then you do not count the entire atom. You only count how much of that atom is inside the unit cell. Atoms at vertices, that is at corners of a unit cell, only count as one eighth of the atom because only one eighth of it is inside the box. Atoms along edges only count as one fourth, whereas atoms that are straddling a face of the unit cell or a cube or box count as one half because that's the amount of that atom that's inside the box. Make sense okay? For example, if you look at the three types of simple unit cells shown right here, we can see that some of the atoms, the ones along the corners or vertices, along the edges or straddling the faces of the cubes are not completely inside the cubes or boxes. This can be seen more clearly using these figures from our text, which you're welcome to pause and consider for a moment. That takes us to this beautiful sample exercise. The unit cell of a binary compound of copper and oxygen is shown right here. Given this image, I want you to determine the empirical formula of this compound. All right, I'll show you how to do this now. So as I just mentioned, any atoms or spheres that are at corners or vertices, well, for those, only one eighth of each atom is counted as being inside the box. Separately, atoms that straddle edges 
are worth one fourth per atom, and those that are along faces of the box are one half. And obviously any atoms that are completely inside the box, well yeah, for those atoms, each atom is counted completely. In this unit cell, we of course have copper and oxygen. And you can see that the copper atoms are completely inside or encased in the box. Thus, all four of these copper atoms will be counted towards our formula. So I begin with copper four. Now the oxygen's a little bit trickier. You can see that there's a central oxygen right here that's completely inside the cube. So we'll count that atom completely as one atom. But what about the remaining eight spheres of oxygen atoms? Yeah, they're all at corners, which count as one eighth per atom. So what does that amount to? Well, yeah, it's eight times one eighth. You do all of the math here, it simplifies to the formula Cu4O2. Now, in order to get down to the empirical formula, I have to divide these numbers by whatever's necessary to get to the smallest whole number ratio. You can see that I can divide each of them by two. Four divided by two and two divided by two, which simplifies our formula to Cu2O1. I hope that was as fun for you as it was for me. We end then with an example problem that I will invite you, my university students, to tackle on your own. The unit cell of nickel arsenide, which we saw a moment ago, is shown right here. I want you, using the same technique I just taught you, to figure out its empirical formula. Until next time, my dear students and others, then, please have an enjoyable rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.